Hi, I'm Bob Knoot, and on this episode of the Camp Chaos Chronicles, we're going to start doing something about the excess population of cats around this farm. Dang it! Now what I mean by that is that due to the circumstances that I outlined in the intro video to this year's series, uh, there's a bit of a backlog of engine building around here and we got to really get that stuff cleared before we can go ahead and do some of the fun stuff that I talked about. So exactly what is that going to look like? Well, I'd like to show you what that looks like, but the fact is I lost about a half dozen clips of video that really uh, explained the history of how far we had come to this point, and can't find them anywhere, but the engines have been taken apart, they've been pressure washed, the uh, cylinder liners were sent out to be resized, the, the aftermarket pistons had been ordered up, the crankshaft was out being reground and uh, just waiting for a lot of parts to come in. And you know what? It seems like everything since COVID takes about 50% more time, sometimes twice the time, to get things done, to get things back than they used to, particularly from a, any company that is situated in California. I'm just saying, okay? But... Where we're at right now is got the blocks back from a shop that has a washer big enough to take the V12 block and got sort of a preliminary cleanup done so that we can actually start doing some measurement and uh, determine what we've really got here. Here we go. At this point, we're ready to do a preliminary measurement on the main bearing saddles for the crankshaft bearings. There's a specific number that that has to be and this really is sort of the go, no go decision time for whether this block is usable or not. You got to get it clean to the point where you know that there's not going to be a problem with dirt in between the bearings and the caps or the block and the caps. Uh, so you need to make absolutely certain that these bosses here are completely clean. There's got to be not only does there not can there not be any dirt in these areas, which would space the cap up away from the block, but also uh, we, what you wanna make sure that there are no burrs along the edge that might've occurred when you were pulling the crankshaft out uh, or just in handling during the course of being cleaned and other operations. Uh, you just need to make sure that these things are in as good a condition as they're going to be when uh, when you actually put the crankshaft in. The other thing that we've got to do is make sure that the bearing caps are clean. Now I've got a piece of aluminum flat plate, half inch thick, that I've got a 320 wet or dry sandpaper piece on one side and 600 on the other. What I do is I hand lap these surfaces. Uh, it's a full eight and a half by 11 sheets. So uh, plenty of plenty of room to get both sides on at the same time. Work it back and forth with some oil in between. Not to change the dimension at all, but just simply to make sure that this surface is absolutely clean and absolutely flat. And it will point out any burrs that you might have on the cap as well, because it'll probably tear the sandpaper, which will be a bummer. But that's kind of, kind of what we're doing, making sure that stuff is in good condition. What we'll do then is... Put the cap on the block and torque it down the way we would if we were doing the final assembly and then measure this bore right here. And the tool that we're gonna to use to do that is a bore gauge. Bore gauge is a really slick tool to use for something like this. It's got two ends to it. Obviously on this end, we got a dial. You can uh, loosen this nut here and rotate the dial to whatever position that you need to put it in to be able to read it under the circumstances and then tighten that knob up again and there's a shaft or something 
some sort of a plunger that goes to this end. And we've got this right here, which moves in and out these little wheels squared in the bore that you're measuring. And on this side, we've got a removable probe. There's a number of different sizes that come with this. It's got sort of a little bearing on the end here that uh, enables you to, that coupled with these two rollers here, enables you to center this in the bore and you've got to move it up and down and right and left in order to get the mid, the measurement that you want. In order to set this, you take a micrometer of the appropriate size. This is a four inch micrometer, measures from three to four. The measure we, measurement we want is 3.1665. And so we set this to 3.1665. And then we set bore gauge in here until we get it centered. Now what you do to set this properly is that when you have the bore gauge in the micrometer, you need to set that dial so that the needle is on zero. What you have to do is you have to take that little knob right there loosen that and as you place this bore gauge in between the two measuring surfaces of the micrometer that is set to the measurement you need you then turn this dial until the zero is on the needle I'm not going to do that here because i got this all set up so once we got this thing set properly it makes it real easy to bolt the caps in place one at a time, starting from the back, because if you put them all on at the same time, it's kind of hard to get this whole thing, you know, aligned properly to read the bore correctly. So there we go. Well, the news isn't great, but it's not awful. As you can see written on this bearing cap, it is one and a half thousandths of an inch. Too big this way, well, it's okay this way. And that's kind of the case all the way down here. You can see the numbers. Um, and this is kind of normal for an engine over time, particularly one that uh, maybe used a little bit harder. I've had some engines that have been right on spec but there's a few of them, particularly my track car engine over time, uh, you know, pretty hard use. Ideally, what you would do is you would take and have this block a line board, which basically involves taking a little bit off the bottom of the block, a little bit off the top of the cap, and then running a hone or a boring bar down the center in order to renew the bore dimension. But there's another manual labor intensive way of doing that that I use. And if you want to know what that is, find the oldest engine builder in town and he'll fill you in. Now, this is the 1991 5.3 liter block. And we can see that the situation is somewhat different here, although we have different problems. Uh, you can see that the block itself has been removed from the hot tank in much better condition than the 85 block. Uh, there's not going to be a whole lot of cleanup required, although you can see some residual oil spots here and there that are gonna to need to be taken care of. And I'm gonna pressure wash this before I finally start putting this back together. You can see that, if I can do this one handed, you can see that the, there's some baked on oil residue inside of the cylinder bosses in the block, but that's not a big deal. Uh, as you can see, it can be cleaned up with just some Scotch-Brite and carb cleaner. That doesn't take very long. Uh, the gasket surfaces for the cylinder head and the valley cover were really pretty darn good. Uh, very little residue on there, just a, a minimum amount of scraping, mostly just Scotch-Brite. And you can see that it came out really nice. There is some pitting, but if we look closely, we can see that the gasket serves itself has been largely untouched. This pitting right here is in between the, the uh, valley cover and the cylinder head. 
where water and stuff has been allowed to accumulate. So um, in that regard, it's a very, very clean block. But if you look at the studs, some of these are looking, well, actually they don't look a whole lot different than a good stud would look. What you got to remember is that this portion of the stud is uh, running through the cylinder head at the point where it's going to be exposed to the water jacket. And most of this crud that you see right here, this is stuff that has built up between the cylinder head and the stud um, due to corrosion. And most of that is gonna scrub right off, as you can see on this side, which I've already done. Now, as I've said before, some of this pitting is not a big deal. That's largely discoloration. You can run your fingernail over it and you can feel it a little bit, but it's not a big deal. Where we run into problems is with, if I can get down in here, is right here where you can actually see where the stud has been necked down. That's where most of the stretching on that stud is going to happen. <clears throat> and that's not good. And a lot of these studs on this side that are taking the trouble to clean up show some necking down. You can see at the bottom of this one, right at the bottom of the, the stud here. If I can get the autofocus to kick in. That's not good. So we're gonna have to replace some studs here. And uh, the ones that are the problem are never gonna be the ones that are on the perimeter because they're not exposed to the water jacket. They're just, they're not, they're not uh, acorn nuts. So you're gonna be able to get water leaking down in here and you know, corroding things, but, but those clean up pretty well. It's these on the inside here that are exposed to the water jacket. There's 10 of these on both sides that are eight and a half inch long. There's 10 of these that are, I believe, six and a half inch long. The ones on the ends are never a problem because they don't run through the water jacket. Uh, those don't have to be replaced. So um, these you can find all day long. The six and a, I believe it's six and a half inch long ones. The eight and a half, not so much. I can get a full set of studs, both the long and the short ones and also all the perimeter ones for almost $900 retail. Don't need all of them. So I'm gonna see what I can locate. But these things typically are not a lot of fun to remove. So I'm not looking forward to this part of the job, at least the ones that I've replaced in the past. So before I get crazy and start ordering studs though, what I'm gonna do is roll this thing over and do the same thing that I did to the 85 block. Clean all this up, get the caps on there, measure the boards and see how that is. I mean, if I got to throw studs at this thing and have this thing aligned board or honed and, you know, it's gonna get expensive. This is the block of the 91. And as you can see, it's not a whole lot better. Now it's time to deal with this crud right here. Now, some of it is just discoloration. Like for example, right here, we should be able to just take some red scotch bright or maybe even the gray stuff, the finer, finer stuff and just wipe it off. But if we look at right here and right here, there's actually a deposit on here that you can, you can actually feel with your finger. That is, you know, some of it will come off with, with the scotch bright, but some of it, you're gonna have to use a scraper of some kind, particularly around the studs. They tend to build up a bit more of a, an accumulation. The general rule is you never use anything to scrape gasket surfaces that is harder than the material that you're gonna be scraping on. Well, okay, I get that, I understand that, but here's what I use. You gotta do it just right, but it works great. These are utility knife blades, and I buy these by the 100 count box for a number of different purposes. Do not use single edge razor blades that are ubiquitous in every toolbox. Uh, they are thinner and they're not of, of high quality material. And as soon as you start using them, the edge rolls over and you get a burr on the backside and you happen to flip it around, you start to really dig out material. 
This is much thicker, much stouter edge. If you're careful, it'll do a great job. What I do, first of all, you do not take and put fingers on both sides and do this, because what that does is it causes the blade to, to curve just a little bit, and you're going to be scraping the edges of the surface and not the middle. So what I do is I take my finger like this and back the edge up and then just scrape. And I always use the same edge down because over time it will raise the burr as well. And you don't want to start digging on your, on your surface. And once you get that done, or get it started, then you can take your scotch bright. And do that. And what you're shooting for is what we have on this side already. That, in my opinion, is about as good as it gets. Now, I don't know if you can see this. What you're shooting for is the ability to actually see the original factory mill marks going across which I think you can just barely see. That means you haven't disturbed the surface to any significant degree. So that's what we're looking for. And that takes a little while to do. This is uh, one of those operations where you really need to take your time and stay focused and do the best job you can. So after all of that measurement and preliminary cleanup, uh, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is those blocks are pretty much usable the way they are. Pretty much, except for one thing. The main bearing bores are just a little bit too big for my liking. So I made the decision that I was gonna send them out to be a line honed. The guy that used to do it is no longer available for some reason. He's kind of a hippy dippy uh, machinist that is one of those guys that is completely unpredictable, but he's exceptional at what he does. Nobody knows where he is right now. So I went to another company that has a, a real good name around the Twin Cities up here, and I took him up there and they said, yeah, we can have him in three weeks. Well, I didn't get any call. Five weeks later, I call and they say, yeah, it's on the schedule for next week. So this isn't helping, but it is what it is. So if you like these videos, like, subscribe, and maybe leave a comment down below so we can know what we can do to do what we do better. So we'll see you the next time on the Camp Chaos Chronicles.